Well, good to see you folks tonight. This is the uh, second of three weeks. We're studying Romans 3.21. At least in theory, last week we said we'd get to it, and tonight we actually will get to Romans 3.21 through 26, the first half of those uh, verses. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank uh, the church again, and Dan Duncan especially, for the invitation to come and speak to you all. It's a great privilege uh, to be here. And uh, I would also like to suggest to you, um, if you will, if you're going to be here next week, it would be really helpful if you were to keep these notes that you've got tonight, because the translation is something that you'll want to look at when we get into the last half of this passage. And I've got the outline notes through all of Romans 3, 21 through 26. So let me open us in a word of prayer and we'll get started, okay? Father, we bless your name. We thank you for your incredible mercy and grace to us who deserve none of it. We thank you for this amazing passage that we simply cannot do justice to. But we ask that your spirit will guide our minds and our hearts so that we can understand as much as possible what he has revealed to Paul and through Paul to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This message tonight, the death of Christ and the righteousness of God, I have titled in the past when I've given a, a, a technical sermon on it. This is not a sermon, it's more a Bible study. But I've called it the Divine Electrolux. Now, that worked for people who were old enough to know what an Electrolux was. Uh, anybody here not know what an Electrolux is? Yeah, so I told, you guys either don't have a clean house or you don't use really old vacuum cleaners. Uh, Electrolux was what I grew up with. And uh, next week, you might be able to figure out why that was a title that I've used for this passage in the past. Here's where we are in our study, though. This is part two of three. Last time we introduced you to Romans. We got almost all the way through what I, uh, my goal was. Tonight is an exposition of Romans 3, 21 through 26, the death of Christ and the righteousness of God. And the next week we'll be applying this passage, but we're really going to deal with these kinds of applications. Is faith uh, alone enough to save us? What did Christ's death accomplish? And we'll also be addressing crucifixion in the ancient world and uh, some of the medical evidence for what it entailed. Now, we're not going to finish the exposition tonight. We're just going to get through the first three verses of this passage, hopefully, and then we'll finish that up next week and then deal with these theological issues as well. We finished last time introducing you to the theme of Romans, and real quickly, we went over that, and we also uh, uh, got into... Uh, the outline very, very briefly. So I want to kind of reiterate that uh, right now so that we can get it while it's fresh and it can stick in your minds. The theme of Romans is the vindication of God's righteousness in Paul's gospel. Now, this is the most systematic of all of Paul's letters. Romans addresses in detail the apostolic kerygma, what Paul's proclamation about the gospel was all about. In the last two verses of the salutation, verses 16 and 17, best articulate the theme of the whole book. And here Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, both to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For the righteousness of God is revealed in it, or in the gospel, from faith to faith, just as it is written, the one who is righteous by faith will live, or the righteous by faith will live. Now, most translations here have the one who is righteous by faith, where you put who is righteous by faith or righteous by faith will live instead of the one who will live by righteousness. I think the focus here, and it is in the Greek, seems to be on the, the idea that somebody who is righteous or declared right with God by faith will have life rather than one who is righteous is living by faith. It's more on salvation, or what we might call justification, than on sanctification. But we won't, 
need to address that tonight, I, uh, and I've already uh, stumbled over that pretty badly, so aren't you glad I'm in Romans 3 instead of 117? So this is the righteous revelation of God in the gospel, though. To flesh this out a bit more, this is where I sort of ended last week, Paul is just as concerned in this letter to vindicate God's righteousness as he is to explain the gospel. Let me state that again. Paul is just as concerned in this letter to vindicate God's righteousness as he is to explain the gospel. Now, the gospel today is often preached without any concern for a holy God, just a loving God. That's not Paul's gospel. Why is it that this was such a major issue to him? Why is God's holiness and his righteousness so important to the apostle? Well, I can give you a couple of reasons. There's, there's several, but here's two that I think are perhaps the most significant for us here. The first is that the Deuteronomic curse guided Paul's theology both before he was a Christian and after. The Deuteronomic curse is found in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, where it says that cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, or cursed by God is everyone who hangs on a tree. When Peter and John spoke before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, most likely what they uh, said to Peter and John was something along this line. How can you say that God blessed this man so much by raising him from the dead ahead of the time of the future resurrection, in fact, when we know that God has cursed him by hanging him on a tree? That was certainly Paul's concern. And as one who was attacking Christians, taking them to prison, seeing them get murdered, he was primarily concerned with God's holiness. And his view was that if Jesus really was raised from the dead, then the Bible is wrong. The Bible meaning the Old Testament, the only Bible that he knew of at the time. Because the Deuteronomic curse says God curses everyone who hangs on a tree. So he knew that God must have cursed Jesus. How in the world could God also bless him by raising him from the dead? So that was, I think, what guided Paul's theology fundamentally before he became a Christian and afterwards. Immediately after his uh, conversion on the road to Damascus, he goes to Arabia for three years, and I have a strong suspicion that what he did was he asked the question, how could I have missed this? I just met the ascended Lord in heaven. I met Jesus Christ, and he's not dead wallowing in some grave someplace. He's alive, and he's the Lord. How could this be true? So he spent these three years in Arabia probably reading over his Old Testament over and over and over again and coming to the conviction that Jesus Christ was cursed, but not for his own sins, but for others' sins. So we'll get into those issues as we get into this text. But uh, let me just uh, point you to Galatians 3.13 real, real quickly. This is Paul's first letter. Galatians was written in uh, the understanding of some, and, and I would include myself in this group, as shortly before the Jerusalem Council, where the apostles got together in Acts chapter 15. It was probably written in A.D. 48 or 49. In this very first letter that Paul writes to the Galatians, and he is white hot mad at these folks because they were listening to some false teachers saying, you have to add to the work of Christ. You have to add to grace. And so he says in verse 13, Christ redeemed us, Galatians 3.13, I'm sorry. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So this is still guiding Paul's theology. It's a key verse in a key chapter in a key book that tells us about his views of salvation. Now, there's another reason, I think, that he was deeply concerned about God's righteousness in his message to the Romans. And it goes again back to this Jerusalem council in Acts 15. There was confusion among these new believers that uh, we, we see in the book of Galatians, uh, we see in Philippians, we see in 2 Corinthians, and we see in the book of Acts, that they're saying, what is it that I need to do to be saved? The Jewish Christians, many of them said, well, you have to be circumcised and you have to follow our dietary laws. There were some, in fact, who were making that claim, and that was one of the principal reasons why they had 
the meeting in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. So look at Acts 15 with me if you would. I've got my brand new net Bible, large print, noteless net Bible. This net Bible has more notes than any other Bible in history, except for this one. It's noteless, it's bedtime reading Bible. Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council. If we look at the first 10 verses, this is happening in AD 49. Uh, now some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. These are people who were purportedly Christians. When Paul and Barnabas had a major argument and debate with them, the church appointed Paul and Barnabas and some others from among them to go up to meet with the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about this point of disagreement. So they were sent on their way by the church. And as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they were relating at length the conversion of the Gentiles and bringing great joy to all the brothers. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all the things God had done with them. But some from the religious party of the Pharisees, who had believed, that is, people who followed the Pharisees but became believers in Jesus Christ, they stood up and said, it is necessary to circumcise the Gentiles and to order them to observe the law of Moses. If you're going to be saved, you have to be circumcised, you have to follow the dietary laws and all the other laws of Moses. That was their view. Both the apostles and the elders met together to deliberate about this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that some time ago God chose me to preach to the Gentiles so that they would hear the message of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, has testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between them and us, cleansing their hearts by faith. They didn't have to follow dietary laws, other Old Testament restrictions, or get circumcised. And he made no distinction between them and us, cleansing uh, their hearts by faith. So now, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in the same way that they are. There's no distinction, the Jerusalem Council came to conclude, between Jews and Gentiles who were Christians. That is, they all came to faith by faith. They became believers. They became Christ followers by faith in Jesus Christ. But there was confusion among these groups. Paul condemns them in Galatians 1. He says that uh, if anyone preaches a gospel that's different from the gospel that we preach, let them be accursed, which means let them go to hell. Even if it's an angel from heaven, he says, that's where they should end up. In Philippians chapter 3, he says, we are the true circumcision, they are the mutilation. And he uses a word that suggests, well, it's very graphic. We won't get into the details. You can pick up the imagery when he speaks about circumcision and the mutilation, but he's saying if you are adding to the gospel of grace, if you're adding to the work of Christ on the cross, then you do not understand the gospel at all. And he addresses these false apostles in 2 Corinthians and elsewhere. They dogged him in his ministry. So when he's writing to the Romans, he wants to make sure that they have a very clear understanding of his gospel. This is the most systematic letter. It's one that he's writing after he's had a long time ministry in the east. Now he wants to go westward. And in Romans 15, he says, I want to go as far as Spain. And I want to use Rome as a base of operations. So let me sum up. Some Judaizers, or those who wanted to follow the Jewish law, had criticized Paul's gospel as being weak on sin because Paul would not subject the Gentiles to the law. And because of this, he needed to justify his gospel. He needed to demonstrate that God had not lowered his righteous requirements for getting in one iota with the coming of Christ. Ultimately, Paul needed to demonstrate that God's holiness was completely intact, even though salvation had bypassed the law. Now that's summing up what we got last week and a little bit more in the details of the Deuteronomic curse and why these things mattered to Paul. Defending God's righteousness was every bit as important to Paul as explaining the gospel. Because if you don't have an absolutely righteous God, you don't have the gospel at all.
So let me uh, get into the outline briefly. This is another handout that you received. It's uh, front and back, where you've got translation on one side, the tra three translations, and then you've got the outline on uh, the other side. So let's go over this very, very quickly. The outline, as I said last week, was simplified and alliterated, and that butchers the text in some ways, so I'll try to unbutcher it as we go through this very, very briefly. But I like using these seven S's to give you a sense of where Romans is going. You've got salutation, the, the beginning, the longest introduction of any one of Paul's letters, of greetings to the, the readers, that is, 17 verses. And then he deals with sin, our sinfulness, chapter 118 through 320. Then he deals with salvation, or we might call it the front end of salvation, justification, in chapter 321 through 425. This is the imputation of righteousness. And then chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8 is sanctification, or the impartation of righteousness. You could call it salvation in the present tense. We're not going to get into any of those details tonight but this is at least the broad outline for you. Then dealing with God's sovereignty, chapters 9, 10, 11. And this, it lays out very neatly. What Paul is addressing in these three chapters is the question, how can I trust God to keep his promise to me if he has failed to keep his promises to Israel? This is a question that these readers would have in their minds because Paul had just concluded Romans chapter 8, this great chapter on sanctification, the chapter that speaks about the Holy Spirit more than any other chapter in the whole Bible. It concludes in verses 35 through 39, a hymn of assurance telling us that there is nothing, absolutely nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ. So he gets into chapter 9. It is not as though the word of God has failed, he says in 9.6. Because God made promises to Israel, has he failed in those promises or has he kept them? It's chapter 8 that is driving him into these uh, discussions about God's sovereignty. And so chapter 9 deals with God's dealing with Israel in the past. Chapter 10, his dealings with Israel in the present. Chapter 11, God's dealings with Israel in the future, where he concludes all Israel will be saved. And then Paul gets into the applicational section especially the service of us to one another the working out of salvation chapters 12 through 15 it's in the assembly in the state in the body where he deals with strong and weak in chapters 14 and 15 and then finally this is where i really fudged on the outline saints chapter 16 1 through 27 well it really it really starts at chapter 15 verse 14 don't blame me i'm not i'm not the one who put these chapters together that was done in the 12th century Paul didn't put them together like this either. The verse numbers weren't added until 1551. So none of those things are original in, in the uh, original text. But chapter 15, verses 14 through 33, is Paul's mission and his reason for writing. And then all of chapter 16 is his greetings to these Christians in Rome. So that's kind of seven S's, if you will. But the key that we're dealing with here is the section that begins salvation at 321 after Paul has just gone through the longest diatribe ever in the Bible against human sinfulness. Okay, now that you've got that, keep that in mind. And I wanted you to have that as a separate handout so you can see where we are in Romans. And on the uh, back side of that, you have the translation, three different translations I've suggested there. So Romans 3, 21 through 26 in its context. Leon Morris aptly calls Romans 3, 21 through 26, possibly the single most important paragraph ever written. That's pretty high praise, wouldn't you think? You can't say that about too many things. Leon Morris chose these six verses to say it about. Possibly the single most important paragraph ever written. Now, some might say, well, but it's so short, six verses. How could this be that important if it's such a short text? Well, think about the resurrection narratives. They're not that long, and yet that's the single most important event in human history, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Its shortness here is hardly an indication of its value. In chapter 118 through 320, Paul got us lost, if you will. He argues at length that we're utterly sinful, separated from God. He says, no one does good, not even one. No one seeks out God, not even one. 
All of us, all of us were spiritually dead because of sin. That's what Paul also says in Ephesians chapter 2. And that's the devastating reality of our spiritual condition before God. You think about this. This is a missionary support letter. And he starts out for three chapters railing against the audience. That's not the best way to raise funds, Paul. Don't you understand? You've got to do it the Dale Carnegie way, how to win friends and influence people. Well, he's, he has to deal with this dilemma before he gets into this. Because we're utterly sinful and because God is utterly holy, how is it possible for us to ever stand in God's presence without being condemned? What he's going to argue is those who want to add the works of the law to the cross work of Christ have actually lowered the holiness of God. They're the ones who've capitulated on his righteousness. They're the ones who are adding filthy rags to the righteousness of Christ. And so he's going to answer this question. And it's the heart of Romans right here, 321 through 26. And yet, that's not the driving force of Paul's soteriology or his doctrine of salvation. For Paul, vindicating God's righteousness, as we've already said a few times, is every bit as important as demonstrating his grace. Especially because Paul's accusers assumed that the apostle had capitulated on the former to promote the latter. In these six verses, the Greek words dikaiosune, dikaiao, and dikaios, which means righteousness or justification for dikaiosune, dikaiao, I justify, I declare righteous, and dikaios means it's an adjective meaning righteous or just. Those, that word cluster, all of them from the same root, appears in every single verse in these six verses except verse 23, and even here, the thought of God's righteousness is clearly seen. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's righteousness is not stated in verse 23, but it's very, very clear there as well. Instances from this particular word group appear seven times in six verses. And I did a little research on this and discovered that Romans has the highest cluster of words in this word group. That is, the ones that have to do with righteousness and justification in the entire New Testament. Chapter 3 has the most in Romans, and Romans 3, 21 through 26 is the most condensed cluster of these words in any passage in the whole New Testament. So it's pretty obvious that just by his word choices, Paul is saying God's righteousness is every bit as important as the grace of God. The vindication of God's righteousness permeates this section. He goes to great lengths to make clear that his gospel in no way undermines God's holiness or winks at sin. So his response to the Judaizers is that his gospel is not soft on sin. In fact, he turns his table on the accusers and he says, the gospel, the true gospel cannot stand unless God is absolutely holy and righteous and true. And the only way we can affirm that is in the cross work of Christ. So let's look at the passage specifically, and before you, you've got three different translations. The ESV, which I understand is the translation y'all use here for the most part. The Evangelical Standard Version. That's not what it really means. Sometimes it's called that. And the NIV. I forgot what the, the acronym means besides New International Version, but there's been some nasty retorts about that one as well. And then the Net Bible, but it's the Net Bible not modified. Now, I was the senior New Testament editor of the Net, and the latest edition just came out by Thomas Nelson last October, and I looked at it and regretted that I hadn't suggested some other changes. So you're getting the very latest of the Net edition, even later than what is published. I want to read just that translation to you. And the key words that are underlined are the ones where there's a difference between the Net Bible and these other standard translations. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed, even though it is attested by the law and the prophets. Now, the ESV and the NIV agree with the net for the most part on that, just a, a couple of minor differences. And I'm not going to deal with synonymous differences, disclosed, revealed, manifested. Those are not the key things. Those are just different ways to translate the same words, understanding them in the same way, too. And then in verse 22, namely, 
the righteousness of God through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That's the first difference between the net and the other translations. That is, they have through faith in Jesus Christ, and the Nut Bible has through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. In verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I think all, all three of these versions have identical wording. While being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, this is going to get into a slightly complicated grammatical point, which I felt, because it's a little bit complicated, I want to leave that till next week. But verse 24 is, in many respects, the heart of these six verses. It's absolutely crucial for us to understand it well. And so I want to take some time rather than go over it too quickly tonight. So while being freely justified, notice how the net is putting this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God while being freely justified. Who's being freely justified? All who have sinned. We'll discuss the first part of that issue tonight. Then verse 25, God publicly displayed him at his bloody death. Now that's just a different way to express what these others have put as by his blood or through the shedding of his blood at his bloody death as the mercy seat. The others have a sacrifice of atonement or propitiation. But the Net Bible takes this Greek word as meaning the actual mercy seat, accessible through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because God in his forbearance had passed over the sins previously committed. And then as I was saying, I'm adding this to the text because it's a resumptive idea. Paul has not shown how God has demonstrated his righteousness by overlooking sins that had been committed in the past. That doesn't demonstrate his righteousness at all. Paul is getting to the point where by saying this, that in his forbearance he's passed over the sins previously committed, he's saying God did not wipe away these sins in the past. All of them were forward-looking to the time when at one point in history God would do that, and that's with the death of Christ. These sacrifices in the Old Testament that had to be repeated every year were like, okay, I'm going to reveal the, the, the divine electrolux point now. They were like a broom sweeping all the dirt under the carpet year after year after year. And the cross is like a vacuum cleaner that takes it all away and removes it forever. It's not the best picture of the death of Christ to think of him as a vacuum cleaner, but you get the idea that the Old Testament sacrifices were temporary. They were there as a symbol where one showed faith in God and did what God required, moving towards the time when the ultimate and really the only sacrifice that can pay for sins would be accomplished in the death of God's own son. So Paul says, as I was saying, this was to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just even while justifying. That's different from uh, and the one who justifies, and we'll talk about that a little bit. It's not that major of an issue, but we'll, we'll discuss it. The one who lives because of Jesus' faithfulness instead of the one or those who have faith in Jesus. So these are some of the differences. The faithfulness of Jesus Christ in verse 22, picked up again in verse 26, the while being justified in verse 24, and the mercy seat in verse 25 are the main issues that we'll, uh, we'll want to look at. But we're going to do a, a brief exposition of the whole text. I told you last time, my prefaces take forever. So let's get into the text. Verse 21, I'm giving you the translation that I've got throughout these verses, and we'll just go through this as we can. Paul begins with, but now. This is a decisive temporal break. It's not a logical break. The cross is the central point in all of human history. That's the major temporal break in history. Everything before it, as far as Paul is concerned, points up to the cross. Everything that comes after it goes back to the cross. There was a German scholar by the name of uh, Konzelman who wrote a book called Die Mitte der Zeit. I'm sure it's on your favorite bedtime reading. The Middle of Time. It was about the cross and the resurrection as being the central point of all of history. That's re remarkable, and that's really how we need to think about it. That is how we think about it when we think about B.C. and A.D., isn't it? And yet, we need to think about the significance of the death of Christ and his resurrection even more than that. So this 
righteousness of God, but now has been revealed apart from the law, Paul says next. And I take it that this apart from the law is defining the kind of righteousness that's in view. It's the, if we could put hyphens in here, the apart from the law righteousness of God has been revealed. The apart dash from dash the da, law dash. No, no, no dash after law, but the apart from the law, that's all hyphenated. So what is Paul saying? He's saying there's a righteousness of God that's been revealed. The kind of righteousness it is, is a righteousness which is apart from the law. What law is he talking about? He's talking about the Mosaic law, the Pentateuch, the Torah. Then, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God is what he says next. And this righteousness, same expression as we see earlier in Romans, in 1, uh, 17, where he gives us the, the, the great theme of the letter that the righteous revelation of God has, has come to us in the gospel. And in chapter 3, verse 5, Paul says... But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The NIV in Romans 3, 5 says, but if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, I like the way they've expressed that, what shall we say? Our unrighteousness is not something that we should exult in. Paul is saying, however, that God's righteousness stands regardless of what we are like. So Romans 3, 5 speaks of the righteousness of God as his character. If our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, if our unrighteousness shows how much greater God is in his holiness and his righteousness in his character, what shall we say? But in 117, it both refers to his character and also to that which God imputes to our account. It's the righteousness that comes from God. It's an imputed righteousness. When Luther looked at Romans 1.17, he thought, how can I ever worship? How can I ever even love a God like this? Because the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. And then Paul goes on and says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. So as far as Luther was concerned, the righteousness of God and the wrath of God were pretty much coterminous. They were identical. And so Luther always felt, before he had his conversion experience, that God was a wrathful, hating God who did not love his creatures. And that it was, he was someone who you tried to appease, but you could never be successful at it. He got some of that right. But what he didn't understand is the grace of God through the death of Christ. So I think what we see in 117, this thematic verse for the whole of Romans, is that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel and that's a righteousness that actually is imputed to us. That is, it's put into our bank account, if you will. God has his righteousness, and when we put our faith in Christ, he says, you now have the same righteousness that I have. It's the righteousness of Christ. God, in fact, looks on you and me as if he looks on his own son. We are treated just as holy as Jesus Christ is. Can you imagine that? Now, you and I know we're not as holy as he is, but in our position, we are. It's not a pretend statement. It's our status. It may not be our state presently. All of us are living sinners. We are the uh, sacrifice that keeps trying to get away from the altar. You know, make yourself, your body's a living sacrifice, and as J. Vernon McGee used to say, the problem with living sacrifices is they keep crawling away from the altar. <laughs> and that's, that is the case. But our status, because we've put our faith in Jesus Christ and we've said, your righteousness is what I'm clinging to, not my own. I'm not trying to add anything to yours. I can't. All I can do is detract from it. I want your righteousness and yours alone to save me, to put me in the right with God. So we're going to wrestle with this idea of what does this mean to have God's righteousness imputed to us? We'll be dealing with that question next week. And we're going to look at actually three different models of the righteousness of God, the Roman Catholic model, the Reformed model, and a view that has come out of an evangelical seminary that's just a few miles south of here. I won't mention the name of it, but um, that ha has muddied the picture, I think, every bit as, almost as much as the Catholic view has. We'll talk about God's righteousness and what that really means. So this righteousness of God, 
that God declared us to be just, he has imputed his righteousness to us, has been revealed. Now Paul is using a verb here, a perfect tense, that he's used just once before in Romans. It carries, I think, some theological weight because it's related to God's revelation. Revel in Romans 1.19, Paul speaks about this. He says, because what can be known about God is plain to them, to those who have rejected him completely, because God has made it plain to them, has revealed it to them, has disclosed it to them. What has he disclosed? A general revelation that he exists and that he is good and sovereign. It's a general revelation. It's one we get in nature, we get in our conscience, we see in history. And Paul says in Romans 1, that's enough to condemn people. It's not enough to save anybody, but it is definitely enough to condemn us. But there's also a special revelation of God that comes through Scripture. And it did come through prophets. Some would give special revelation that was not encoded in Scripture. But for us, for all practical purposes, special revelation means the Bible. And this points to salvation. So in verse 19 of chapter 1, Paul speaking about general revelation, it's enough to condemn. Spe special revelation is what we need that's enough to save, and that's in 321, this passage. So this righteousness of God has been revealed, and Paul begins by saying it's apart from the law, the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments. And then he switches in how he uses the word law just a little bit in this next phrase even though it is attested by the law and the prophets. Now, what he means by the law and the prophets is a well-known Jewish idiom that simply meant the entire Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, from Genesis to Malachi. And so what uh, Paul is saying here is that the Old Testament law was not the way in which someone could get saved by obeying the law. Let me, I want to be very careful with my wording here. By obeying the Old Testament law, that's not what's going to save you. It's by living by faith in the God who saves. And the way you exercise that faith, the way you demonstrated in the Old Testament, was by doing the sacrifices and being obedient to God. But you recognize that nothing that you did was contributing to your salvation. In chapter 4, Paul's going to go on and he's going to say, let me give an example. Abraham. He was considered righteous before God before he was ever circumcised. How could that be? So he, he uses Genesis 15, 6, and uses that as his great exposition of Abraham, the father of all Jews and, and others that uh, fit into that uh, family. It says, even Abraham was justified without circumcision before the law. The Revised English Bible here has, but now, quite independently of the law, Though with the law and the prophets bearing witness to it, the righteousness of God has been made known. I think that's a, that's a great statement. Let me read it to you again. But now, quite independently of the law, though with the law and the prophets bearing witness to it, the righteousness of God has been made known. In one sense, this righteousness is not found in the law. That is, it's not something that could be obtained by obeying the Mosaic Code. Paul says in Romans chapter 10 that the Jews are seeking a righteousness, but not according to truth. It's a righteousness by their own works. He goes on and says that Christ is the end of the law. You cannot become righteous by your own works, by works of the law. And then in another sense, the law and the prophets does witness to this righteousness. Paul is saying, on the one hand, there's continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He starts his whole book this way by saying the Old Testament prophets spoke of the coming Messiah. He is saying, I have continuity. My message is not against the Old Testament. There is continuity, and yet there's discontinuity, because this righteousness is not foreign to the Old Testament, though it was inaccessible through the law. It was testified by the law and the prophets but it couldn't be obtained through works of the law. So Paul's preaching is not a gospel that contradicts the Old Testament. His gospel fulfills it. It does not destroy it. There are some today who are speaking about the Old Testament as a text for yesteryear. 
that it's something that we really don't need to consider anymore. We are New Testament Christians, and so we hardly even need to read the Old Testament. That heresy really took its greatest footing in about A.D. 140 when Marcion of Rome was spreading that, saying the God of the Old Testament is a, 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 a wicked God, an evil God. The God of the New Testament is one of love and grace and mercy, and that's the God that we want to love. And yet there's some that really grow out of a perverted view of dispensationalism that would say, we don't need to have the Old Testament anymore. So we, we call those people Marcionites. And sometimes we joke about it at the seminary that there are some who act like Marcionites as if they have the Old Testament, but that's just kind of the prelude to the new. And it's maybe, you know, not much there, but it's just a preface. It's a little bit more than that, I think. Paul goes on, he says, what kind of righteousness is this? Namely, the righteousness of God. The ESV has the righteousness, NIV has this righteousness, and the Net Bible has namely the righteousness. It's one word in Greek, de, which means but, and, now, or namely. The uh, NIV didn't, or the ESV uh, didn't translate it. That's unusual for the ESV not to translate a conjunction and for the NIV to do it sort of with their this righteousness. But the Net Bible picks up the theme more explicitly, namely the righteousness. The righteousness that was revealed now this righteousness of God is what Paul is now going to explicate in this verse. He's going to define it. What does he mean by the righteousness of God? All three translations are really interpreting the Greek the same way. The righteousness mentioned in verse 21 is now defined in verse 22. And then he says, at least this is what I think he says, through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. With this phrase, the Net Bible departs from most other translations the ESV, NIV, and a host of others have through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if you were to go back to the authorized version, the King James Version of 1611, you would discover that they punt on this. They're not sure what to do with it, I think. They say, by faith of Jesus Christ. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean by faith in Jesus Christ? By the faith of Jesus Christ? There's uh, one New Testament scholar who said, yeah, this is talking about Jesus' faith. It's possible, but I don't think that's the meaning. Or is it by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ? There may have been a split on the King James Translation Committee, and they decided, we're just not sure which way to go, so we're going to leave it ambiguous. The problem you have with translations that leave it too ambiguous is sometimes what you end up with is a translation in English that means nothing in English. All translation is interpretation. You have to interpret at some point along the line, you have to interpret. And I think the best kind of translation is one that interprets as little as possible where it's not necessary to do so, where the English reader can figure it out from the translation. But where it is necessary, you, you have to do it. You can't just leave it like that. The Net Bible has been very bold to take it as through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Back when Cranfield was writing his commentary in Romans that was published in the 1970s, he cited one article that was done in something like 1896 in German that took the idea of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. He said, but that doesn't have much merit to it. And then he just went on. This is a commentary you may remember last week I said is what Harold Honer thought was the finest commentary ever written on Romans. And I think he may, on any book of the, of the Bible actually, he may be right. I think Cranfield missed it on this point. There's two basic issues that I want us to address here. One of them is a lexical one, having to do with the meaning of the Greek word, and the other is a grammatical or syntactical one. And these two are interrelated, but sometimes there can be a little bit of confusion. So in terms of the lexical difference, this word, the Greek word pistis, can mean either faith or faithfulness. It depends on the context, but both are used frequently enough. And the idea can be faith in, or faithfulness of. That's a grammatical issue. It has to do with whether we're dealing with what's called a subjective genitive or an objective genitive. If I say, like Paul does, the love of Christ constrains me, do I mean my love for Christ constrains me? Or do I mean his love for me constrains me? His love for me would be a subjective genitive. That is, the of word is actually functioning like the subject of that word love. 
An objective genitive is where that of word, the genitive word, is functioning like the object of the word love. So is it Christ's love for me, subjective genitive, or my love for Christ that constrains me? In this passage, is it the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, that is, that Jesus Christ is faithful? That would be a subjective genitive. Or is it that faith in Jesus Christ, belief in Jesus Christ, is what Paul is talking about? That would be an objective genitive. Is that relatively clear? I, I would think with this group, you guys could track with me pretty easily on this. Now, all of these translators would agree the object of our faith is Christ. But those who consider the faithfulness of Christ as the meaning here also see something else. The focus in this passage is on what Christ accomplished more than on what we must do to be saved. R.B. Hayes, a professor at uh, Duke University, said that this rendering has a Christocentric rather than an anthropocentric focus. That is, it's focusing more on what Christ has done rather than what we should do. If this verse refers to Christ's faithfulness, then it implicitly affirms the fundamental point that Paul is articulating in this entire letter. God's righteousness that is now revealed in no way contradicts or destroys the Old Testament. That is, if it's Christ's faithfulness, it's Christ's faithfulness to the Old Testament law. He was the perfect Passover lamb, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. And because he is, we are no longer under the curse of the law. So it's fulfilled. The law is fulfilled in that Christ is the one who fulfills all of the law's requirements, and I think rendering them no longer authoritative over our lives. We please God by a different standard altogether. So let me get into the weeds a little bit further, and then I want to wrestle with what the implications of this may be, which I think are, are frankly pretty astounding for our lives. First of all, I'll, and I'll go through some of these points rather uh, quickly, there's three basic arguments for the idea of faith in Christ. There's the context, the word which is the Greek word pistis occurs all over this section with apparently the same meaning every time is what one commentator has pointed out. The word pistis is the Greek word that can be translated either faith or faithfulness. And this, trans or this commentator said every time it means faith. Then there's the lexical force. That's the normal meaning of this word is it means faith rather than faithfulness. And then the historical, or we might say the Protestant historical argument this is the view that has been held for centuries, and it's especially indebted to Luther's insistence on sola fide, faith alone. Luther also, also insisted on Christ alone, solus Christus. So which one is the focus here? The arguments for the faithfulness of Christ lexically, this word can mean faithfulness as well as faith. And it does so in Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And it goes on, it says faithfulness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control is the last three things. Pistis is that word faithfulness. In Romans 3.3, 3, will our unfaithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? There, this same word is used, and this is in the same broad context, the same chapter. So it's not correct to say that the meaning is always faith in this section. Their faithfulness will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it, Paul says in 3.3. As part of this section, and, and, and in some sense informing it, really, I think when you think about the, it, it's pistis theou, I hesitate to use, use uh, uh, too much Greek in here. This is not a Greek class, and that's normally what I just teach, so I ask the students to translate, and now I have to do it for you. But the pistis theou means either faith in God or faithfulness of God. It can't mean the faith of God. That would be nonsense in Romans 3.3. God does not have faith. He doesn't need faith. He's omniscient, right? So that's not the meaning. Nobody would take it that way. But in Romans 3.3, you've got this word which can be translated faith or faithless followed by a genitive that can either mean in God or of God. And so it can't mean the faith of God, and it certainly is not their meaning faith in God. It must mean faithfulness of God. 
The grammatical argument that I would use is that nowhere in Paul's letters is there unambiguous evidence that the apostle ever used an objective personal genitive with this word pistis. That is, that you have faith in something. Anytime the word pistis is followed by a personal noun in the genitive, the unambiguous places, all of the unambiguous places, are pointing not to faith in something, but the faith or the faithfulness of something. We get that in the very next chapter, Romans 4.12. It's the faith of Abraham, Paul talks about there. It doesn't mean faith in Abraham. He's talking about what Abraham believed. So you see how complex these issues are. You've got one where you can say, well, but it's faith there, not faithless. That's true. I'm talking about the grammatical point. And I think in Romans 3.22, what we're dealing with is both the grammatical and the lexical and the contextual issues. Now, if the phrase means faith in Christ, then there's some redundancy in this verse because the very next clause says, for those who believe. Now, Paul is not opposed to redundancy, but he seems to use such economical language in this passage that I would hesitate to immediately say that he's talking about faith in Christ for everyone who believes. Why would he have to say that again? It's faith in Christ. So I take it that he means the faithfulness of Christ, which is applied to everyone who believes. And finally, the broad contextual sense is this. If we take it as the faithfulness of Christ, it shows that Paul's view of righteousness is not soft on sin. It better fits with his overall concern for the vindication of God's righteousness because Christ had to be perfectly faithful to the Old Testament covenant because his faithfulness has to cover believers' unfaithfulness. And it fits in very well with the context here with the focus on God's righteousness. When it comes to Luther and the historical argument, I would say semper reformanda, always being reformed. Luther was right on so many things, but I think he may have missed it on this particular phrase. This is not a denial of sola fide or faith alone, but it's rather a focus on solus Christus, Christ alone. And finally, and this is where all this comes down to affect our lives, the theological argument, the object of our faith is worthy. If we just have faith alone, it's not faith alone that can save us. It must be faith alone in a worthy object. It's faith alone in Christ alone that saves us. And there's so many Christians that put an emphasis just on faith alone that the object of their faith is almost negotiable. Well, yeah, Christ died for me, but I'm not sure in what sense he did. Well, if you don't know in what sense he did, then I'm not sure your faith alone is going to have much effect. This is the point of Romans 3.25, where he is actually the mercy seat that God has publicly displayed. God is just to declare sinners' righteousness precisely because Jesus Christ paid the price. Now, I am giving six arguments on my side versus three on the other. Therefore, it must be right, because it's more points, right? It reminds me of a professor at Dallas Seminary who wrote 50 arguments for a pre-tribulational rapture. One of my professor friends said, if this is 50 bad arguments, it doesn't trump three good arguments on the other side. <laughs> so it may be that my arguments aren't that satisfactory, but I want to say this as well. All evangelical translators, all orthodox translators recognize that both of these translations are affirming the worthiness of Christ as the object of faith, and that faith is the means of accessing Christ's righteousness. Whether that is the point of this passage or not is key, and I take it that this particular phrase, pistis Christu, is not a phrase that Paul uses to refer to faith in Christ, but it's something about his own faithfulness that is the basis for us. So Paul goes on, he says, for all who believe. This is a present participle in Greek, and it's not too much to say that the meaning here is for all who continually believe. It's speaking of us as a characterization of our lives, that we are believers. But it's also speaking of it, and this is the the normative way in which the apostolic witness to Christ speaks. It uses the present participle, those who continually believe. It doesn't say those who did once believe are the ones who are saved. 
In fact, there are some who would say, well, yeah, you could believe once and then stop believing and still be saved. That would mean there's unbelievers who are getting to heaven. I see nowhere in Scripture that gives me comfort for that idea. The present participle is used in the New Testament consistently to refer to genuine saving faith. Why is it that we could continue to believe? It's because the <laughs> Spirit of God is the one who is causing us to continue to believe. If the Spirit of God left our hearts right now, we'd walk out of here as unbelievers. So don't act as if it depends on you. But if someone claims to have faith in Christ and then stops believing, don't pretend to think, well, they're saved. They made this confession a long time ago. They're not, they're not believing anymore, but I, I still have this assurance that they're saved. I, I don't think that's a biblical view. Let me conclude this way. I think this is a, just a helpful illustration and something that's just, just important for us to wrestle with, the worthiness of the object of our faith. I've used an illustration. Let's say there's two men standing before a, a, a cliff with a chasm that drops off hundreds and hundreds of feet, sure death if they fell. Before both of them are bridges. There's one bridge that's a six-lane superhighway going across this chasm to the other side. The other bridge is rickety old pieces of wood that are held together by termites holding hands. You know, it's just, it's <laughs> barely making it. Now, you have one person who's standing in front of the rickety bridge, and he's saying, I have faith that this bridge will hold me up. Steps out on it, immediately it breaks, he falls to his death. Did that faith save him? Of course not, because the object of his faith was not worthy. The other one is looking at this six-lane highway, and he's thinking, I just don't know if this is going to do it, but I'm going to believe. I'm going to put enough faith in this bridge that I step out on it. In fact, maybe stepping out is too much, but I'm going to crawl out on it. And he crawls all the way across the six-lane highway. Did that faith save him? Yes, it did. Now, if he had stood there and made it a theoretical point, well, I, I think it could save me, but I'm, uh, you know, I, I really do think it will save me, but I'm just not going to go across the bridge. That's not going to save. You have to put your trust in Jesus Christ to be saved. He is the worthy object of our faith. And it's only because he is worthy that our faith counts for anything. Let me see if we can take questions for just a few minutes. The object of genitive has been the majority view. Faith in Christ has been the majority view. But there is a growing minority of scholars who are arguing faithfulness of Jesus Christ. It's still a minority position. But when we worked on the Net Bible, uh, the original translator for Romans held to the objective genitive. And the uh, editorial committee was leaning towards the subjective genitive. And he said, why don't you check with some of the leading scholars in Australia, in Britain, and in uh, the Americas to see what they hold to. And uh, so I contacted uh, all these scholars, and they all said, well, uh, we think that the subject of genitive is, is growing, and, and uh, even that it was most likely. So he said, well, that's just a small representation. Why don't you check this? <laughs> so he kept wanting to notch it up. But, it is an interesting thing that it's a, it's a growing opinion and more and more research is being done that suggests it's the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Now, all of us can agree to that. The question is whether that's what Paul is saying here. But I think that's a marvelous truth to wrestle with. And that answers the question of the Judaizers who say, wait a minute, Paul, you're being soft on sin. No, I'm not. The standard is Christ's death on the cross. It's his faithfulness to God. It's not our faith in faith. It's our faith in him that saves us. Yes? In Acts where he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, is believe pistis? Also? It's the verb pistuo. Yeah, it's, it's the verbal form of, of this. So it's the same. Yeah, same root. Okay. Right. So that would be the, op I, I'm sorry, I got that. genitive. And well, here's, here's the thing, and that's an interesting. I'm not disputing. No, 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 what you're, what you're pointing out. And, and let's, let's conclude with this. Mm -hmm. The verb will take as its object 
the, the Lord, in, it, but it uses, it, it uses a construction that's entirely different from a noun plus a, a genitive. In fact, when you think about the four Gospels, which one do you think would be, might be considered the, the Gospel of belief, the Gospel of faith? Which one of the four? John, yeah. You know the word belief or faith never occurs in John's Gospel? Not once. But the verb believe occurs a hundred times. For him, it's put your faith in Jesus Christ. He doesn't speak of the faith of Jesus Christ, faith in. He speaks about believing in, trusting in, putting your faith in. A hundred times. So I think you're dealing with different constructions that mean different things. <laughs> Dan, what does the faithfulness of Jesus Christ entail? Besides satisfying God's wrath against sinners, what else are you saying it? Is fulfilling of the Old Testament law. I take it that that's a part of it, too. And that's why in Romans 10, 4, Paul says Christ is the end of the law. He is both the goal and the completion and the termination of it. Uh, Jesus himself said that I have not come to destroy the law. He didn't destroy it. Uh, he fulfilled it. But they both have the same ultimate effect in that we are no longer under the law. One of them does it illegitimately. The other one does it legitimately. And so... Uh, that's, that's my understanding of the New Testament, that Paul is very, very clear that we are not under the Old Testament law, uh, but now we have the law of Christ that guides us. It's a, it's a different, it's the New Covenant is what it is. And the New Covenant is it's just not real clear on all the details precisely because, as Jeremiah says, that... Uh, no one will need to tell his neighbor, I am God, because the law of God will be written on their hearts. What does he mean? I think he means the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit of God is the one who causes us to understand God's will for our lives through the scriptures, uh, through personal direction. And it's not that we have these 600 Old Testament laws that are telling us how we need to live our lives. Now we live by a different standard. So that's why Paul says, walk in the Spirit. He doesn't give us a formula of what that means. Be filled by the Spirit. He doesn't say, here's the four steps you need to go through to be filled by the Spirit. This is New Covenant. It's pretty exciting and uncomfortable at the same time. All right, folks. Thank you so much. Hope to see you next week.